He has no rival. He has no rival. You know, I've been thinking about that a lot. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself right now. But, but you know, church, I've, I've just been thinking a lot. You know, uh, a, a week ago, uh, I, I came back to America, and it just so happened, me coming back, uh, one of my very close friends in, in Griffin, Georgia, uh, his sister killed herself. Suicide took her life. You know, church, and, 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 and I've been thinking about that a lot. This young girl, she was raised in church. She lived in church. She had, she had a successful job in Atlanta. And, and this woman, she was so hopeless to where she took her life. She was raised in church. Is that not crazy to you? You know, I've, I've been thinking about that church. I've been thinking about something else. I was just talking to a pastor a couple days ago, and I was just telling him how I said, you know, preaching is the most exhausting thing I think I've ever done. Uh, you know, I've, I've done all these things where I've driven across Ukraine, I've, uh, I've, I've worked out and, and, and did a bunch of farming in Africa, but, but the most exhausting thing I've ever done is preach. And he said, well, Coleman, it's because of this. It's because when you preach, you're, you're, you're giving so much of your emotion, you're giving so much of your physical energy, but, but you're not just preaching to the people in the pews. You're not just preaching to the people in this room. You're, you're preaching in an audience of heaven. And you're not just preaching in an audience of heaven. You're preaching to the demons in hell. Listen, church, tonight I don't want to just have a service. I don't want to just preach a, a sermon that we're going to clap our hands for. Well, I want to do some war tonight. I want to do some war against the enemy. And I want to make sure that in Buford Church of God, there's never anyone who gets too hopeless. Never anyone that's too far from the power of God. So Jesus, right now, Lord, we just submit these next few moments to you, God. God, we as a body right now, God, we just say, would you anoint this place, God? God, would your spirit fall down on this place, God? Even right now as we are in this place, God, and we're going to go through a service, God, would your spirit begin to fall down on our youth, God? Would your spirit begin to fall down on our children, God? In very common ways, God, may your spirit begin to fall down, God, and would you, God, just begin to anoint anoint our children God with you God may they just begin to, to be raised up as prophets in these last days Jesus Lord we want to see you tonight God would you reveal yourself we ask these things in your name Jesus we pray amen you may be seated church we're going we're gonna to read the word in just a second I'm a terrible missionary and Pastor Joey always reminds me of this you know, every time I come here, I forget to give you guys an update of overseas, and Pastor Joey always bails me out. Uh, but Pastor Joey's not here tonight, so I'm actually going to be the one to have to tell you what's going on overseas. But uh, overseas, uh, things are happening so fast. God is blessing this ministry so much. Uh, in Africa, we've got up to 20 orphanages now. Uh, in January, we just launched... Uh, an orphanage that we've been working on for some time. Uh, it's in the, the most dangerous place I've ever been to in this world. And we built this big, beautiful orphanage. Uh, I'll just tell you guys this. When I walked onto that property, uh, we were going to build this really tiny, kind of obscure orphanage. But, but God spoke to me from John chapter 1. That says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. And so what did we do? We built the biggest and brightest. We painted it this bright yellow. <laughs> we built the biggest building. You can see it from a mile away. And we're just begging the rebels to come and take what's God's. Uh, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Uh, over in Africa where I've been, I've been to so many countries just here recently. Uh, but uh, God's just been blessing so many connections. Uh, I was just, uh, about a week and a half ago, I was talking uh, with uh, a, a man who's oversees a lot in Africa. He's a Kenyan man. Uh, and he, he said, hey, uh, about two months ago, the president of Malawi called me. And uh, he asked me, he said, he said they, they, they have a lot of uh, challenges with orphans in their country. He said, you're the first person uh, I thought of. Coleman, would you, would you go and would you meet the, the president of Malawi? And... Uh, I'm just a guy from Griffin, Georgia, okay? <laughs> but, uh, but, but the Lord will raise us up if we'll let him. 
And uh, so right now we're, we're, we're doing five major building projects in Africa. We're expanding the outreach so much. We're rescuing more children uh, every single day. And, and, and so that's all happening. And then there's something that I have just been looking forward to sharing with you. I have not announced what I'm about to tell you guys to anybody else. Uh, and, and so tonight you're the first ones to hear it. Uh, but on June 1st, we are closing on a property in Ukraine. Uh, amen. I think we've got some photos uh, of that property. Um, this is, a, it's currently a hotel and it's in, in western Ukraine. Uh, Pastor Joey and I, we went and visited this uh, in January uh, and, and looked at it. He, he inspected it. Uh, but we are closing on this property. What we're wanting to do with this property is we're, we're wanting to take the orphanage that's in Germany right now, bring them back to Ukraine. There's about 25 children there. And then we're wanting to restart operations. And so uh, this building can hold a lot more than 25 children. And so we're wanting to rescue uh, a lot of orphans in Ukraine. Uh, there are so many orphans right now because of this war. And there are no one... Uh, to there's no orphanages taking children in right now and so we're purchasing this property we're closing on it and uh, and I could not be more excited we're, we're, we're gonna expand this thing we're gonna rescue more children look I know right now one thing that's really interesting to me is there's uh, the, the news about Ukraine is is shifting and, it, and it's starting to get political some people are on one side some people are on another how many of you know we're not on a side we're on God's side and wherever we go, we're going to establish the kingdom of God. And, uh, and that's what I'm believing on this property right now. I've been talking with Pastor Joe. We were planning a trip to go dedicate this. But what I would love to do tonight uh, is, is just reflect for just a moment, celebrate with this with you. But, but I would like, like, like me and Pastor Joe, we're going to go over there and we're going to dedicate this. We're going to pray for this and we're going to anoint this property. But tonight, in this first announcement of it, I would just like it if you guys could pray over this property. You know, I'm a, I'm a Pentecostal, and so that means I'm a little weird. Amen? <laughs> and, uh, and, and you ain't Pentecostal if you ain't a little weird. And I love it that, that, that we can be a little weird. And one thing that I believe so fully is that God can inhabit a place. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, God inhabited the tabernacle and God inhabited the temple. These were just man-made structures, but because God's presence dwelt in it, if a priest even had a little bit of sin, it, he would die at the spot of being in the presence of God. I believe that the Spirit of God can inhabit this place so much so that any traumatized child in Ukraine, any child who has lived under the threats of bombs, who has shaken in, in, in a bomb shelter, can, can experience the freedom of Jesus Christ in that. But we've got to pray for that. And so tonight, would you, would you join me in prayer for this property? And here's how I'd like to do it. I, I'm going to let you start the prayer and then I'm going to finish it. How about that? That sound good to you guys? See, if you could just stretch your hands out to it. And right now, would you just begin to pray? Jesus, right now, we just ask that your spirit would dwell in this property, Father. God, that you would set up a wall around it, Father. That it would be a place, an oasis of your Holy Spirit, God. God, in the midst of war, God, in the midst of carnage, God. God, would you just raise up an oasis of your Holy Spirit, God. So much so that even visitors, when they come and they visit, that they might see your glory, God. God, would you set children free from trauma? God, would you rescue children, God? And would you continue? Continue to establish your kingdom on this earth, God. God, and everyone who has contributed to this property, God. Uh, so many of the members here in Buford Church of God who have given to this, God, I ask that you would bless them with that same spirit, Father. God, would you bless those? Jesus, and would you move in our service here tonight? We ask you to in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Before we get into the word, there's a video. I was just talking to Pastor Gennady, and he wanted to extend his greetings to you. Speaking of Ukraine, I forgot about that. Uh, brothers and sisters from Atlanta, Georgia, I never forget the song. Georgia, my <laughs> Let me say big thanks to stand with Ukraine. Big greetings from Ukraine, from my country. Right there. Just uh, one hour ago, today, the 
This is last part, uh, former Soviet Union empire. Uh, thanks for help us. Thanks for staying with us. Thanks for pray and thanks for your donation. Thanks for everything. And let me say special thanks for Pastor Grizzly and uh, for Coleman about their hearts for with Ukraine. God bless you all. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, God bless America. God bless Ukraine. Amen. I don't know if there's a mispronunciation of Pastor Joey's name that he loves more than that. <laughs> Pastor Grizzly. I love it. But, uh, I'd ask you to keep these men in your prayer. You know, we've got chaplains teams that go out on the front line every single day. They're risking their lives. And, uh, and they're not only risking their lives, they're going through a lot emotionally. Uh, these men go through a lot of stress. And you can just imagine, like he was saying, uh, he got surrounded by uh, missiles just the other day. Uh, imagine what that does to someone's mind. And uh, so just be praying for his mind. Um, I, when Pastor Joey asked me, uh, when we're talking about me speaking here tonight, uh, right when we were talking, I said, I know exactly what I'm going to preach on. I so fired up to preach on it. And then last night I called him and said, hey, you know, I think I'm going to change it up a little bit. <laughs> and so I'm so grateful for Pastor Gary and Pastor Mia who at the last minute got these communion cups together. We're going to take communion at the end of the day. Um, but like I've told you right when I got up here, you know, there's been a lot here uh, on my mind lately. And, and, and both of those things have been on my mind. And, and there's been a third thing that's been on my mind. And, and that's what's really motivated today's message. It's that this Sunday we're celebrating Memorial Day. And in Memorial Day, what do we celebrate? We celebrate that, that men and women have gone out and fought and, and risked their lives, and, and many gave their lives for this country. Uh, just like Pastor Joey or Pastor uh, Gennady has, has undergone so much stress, so many soldiers have, have undergone so much stress uh, fighting uh, that we might be able to worship here like we're doing tonight in peace. Uh, men have gone out, men and women have gone out and they've done this. Uh, for the sake of freedom. And, uh, but there's another beautiful thing that's happening this Sunday. It's that Memorial Sunday and Pentecost Sunday uh, are lined up right together. And you know, you think about all of those soldiers who went out and, and they gave their lives for their freedom. And then you just think about the Son of God. Jesus Christ, and this isn't to diminish one or compare them, but, but just to see the similarities here, that Jesus Christ, he came and he lived among us, he suffered for us, he died on a cross, he rose again from the dead, and, and then in Acts, uh, we see the, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, on, on 120 men and women, and that power of the Holy Spirit brought freedom to so many. Scripture says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is Freedom. And that's what we see in Pentecost. You know, the, 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 the goal line, the end zone of, of, of what I view as the ministry overseas with orphans, it, it, it's changed a lot over the years. At first, I just wanted to be able to rescue children uh, out of a place of, of bondage. I wanted to, to be able to take them from a place of hopelessness and, and get them to a place of safety. And then my mind shifted and I said, okay, no, we don't want to just get them to a place of safety. We want to make sure that they have long-term um, uh, viability for their lives. We want to get them into colleges and university. And we don't want to just give them the bare minimum of food. We want to give them the very best of food. We want them to have healthy diets. We don't want them just staying in ratty buildings. We want to stay in, in nice buildings with, with roofs that work and, and, and with good floors and good paint. We want them staying in nice places. But then... Uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, that, that, that end zone shifted a little bit more. It wasn't that we just want to make sure children are safe. We, it wasn't that we just want to make sure that, that they have good, uh, a good state of, of livelihood. But I started to think, I, I want them filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Because if anything's going to change someone's life, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's still today what I look for. I don't want to just rescue more children. I want to see the Spirit of God falling on our sons and our daughters. I want to see prophets and teachers and apostles and pastors raised up out of these orphanages. And then we keep expanding and we keep operating in more orphanages and that's still my same hope today. But today is not Pentecost Sunday. Today is Wednesday. <laughs> it's not Pentecost Sunday. And what I'm reminded of today is that there was a time period between Jesus raising from the dead and Pentecost. Jesus rose from the dead. He spent time with people. And, uh, and there were several accounts in, in Luke, uh, in the Gospel of Luke and, and in Acts, he mentions several accounts of where Jesus is with his people. And, uh, and, and, and I'll just read this just to open us up in Acts chapter 1. Verse, starting in verse 4, it says, On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus rose from the dead, and he didn't just ascend to heaven. He spent time with his disciples. Paul tells us in Corinthians that there was about 500 people who saw Jesus. And, and, and what was Jesus doing? He was preparing them for something. He was preparing them to receive a gift from his Father, the gift of the Holy Spirit, a promised gift that would change their lives. Tonight, what I want us to do as a body is I want us to prepare ourselves for Sunday. I want us to prepare ourselves and I want us to even prepare this space. I told you at the beginning of the service, what I want to do tonight is I want to do a little bit of war. You see, I believe that God can inhabit a place and I believe that, that this Sunday, although Jesus pours out His Spirit every single Sunday... Uh, here at Buford, I believe that this Sunday God can do something exceptionally powerful in the lives of people. And tonight I just want to do a little bit of war with you guys. I want to prepare ourselves. I want to cleanse ourselves of any sin that's in the body. And I want us just to be able to pray and anoint this place with the Spirit of God in preparation for Sunday. Today's sermon is not just a sermon that I'm going to finish today. It, it is a sermon that I'm going to pass the baton to Pastor Joey to and that he's going to finish Sunday. That's not something we're planning. But, 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 but I'm letting you know that, that today's service is not an isolated event. This is a preparation time for us. Jesus prepared his disciples and, and we need to prepare ourselves. Jesus said uh, at the very beginning in, in Acts, he says that he should go and wait for, for the promised gift. You know, I think a lot of times uh, in the church what we do is, is we can memorialize something like this without ever encountering it. You know, uh, there's, I've been reading through... Jeremiah and in Jeremiah there's this strange little passage and it says uh, that we ate our fathers ate sour grapes and now our teeth are soft some of you remember that verse what a strange verse how is a father eating sour grapes going to affect his kids teeth it doesn't it doesn't work like that and if a father encounters the power of the Holy Spirit it doesn't mean the son is going to you see, we have to make our faith our own. Our children at some point when they go up, grow up, they're going to have to make their faith their own. And we can celebrate what happens in the book of Acts. And, and let me just read to you just so we can get a proper vision of what we're talking about here, of what happens at Pentecost. On, in Acts chapter 2 it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. After this, these men and women, they go to the four corners of the earth and they establish the kingdom of God on this earth. These were people who were just three years prior were a bunch of fishermen, uh, tax collectors, sinners. And they, they, their lives were changed by Jesus, but when they encountered the power of the Holy Spirit, it not only brought them freedom, they, they, they started taking that freedom to other people. And we see in Acts chapter 2 just this miraculous event of, of, of fire falling down, tongues of fire on people's heads, violent wind uh, ushering through a place. And people's lives being changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the same way that, you know, just because our fathers ate sour grapes doesn't mean our teeth are soft. I want to ask you a question here tonight. Have you received the same promise? Jesus says, go and wait in Jerusalem. I'm, I, I promised something for you. It's a gift for you. And those people received that which was promised. And the question we have to ask ourselves tonight is, have I received that which was promised? I'm not just sitting here talking about speaking in tongues. Have I received the fullness of the promise of God? That's what I want for every single person here tonight and every single person that's coming here on Sunday. These men were prepared for these moments. How were they prepared? Jesus tells them to go and wait. Waiting is not a fun thing. Amen? My goodness, I go to a doctor's office, I start thinking I got every disease in the book. <laughs> Nobody likes to wait, and especially in this day and age where we can have everything so on demand. We've got this kind of fast food faith. We think we can just go through this drive through of a church, get what we need and take it. But what we're doing is we're, we're just settling on spiritual junk food when God has so much more for us. And what we need to do is we need to learn how to sit and wait. You see, that's something that our Pentecostal forefathers knew how to do. They would get into a room and if they felt the Spirit of God falling on a place, they would pray until they received the fullness of it. Church, one thing we've lost how to do in, in, in church today is, is this art of tarrying in the presence of God. Church, we've got to relearn how to tarry in His presence. We've got to get men and women who, like Jacob, say, hey, I'm going to wrestle with you, God, until you bless me. If it takes me all night, I'll wrestle with you all night. God, if you got to break my hip, God, break my hip. If you got to change the way I walk for the rest of my life. Change it, God, but I'm not leaving until you bless me. These men and these women, they gathered together in an upper room and they were not going to leave until God poured out His Spirit. They weren't going to leave until they got what Jesus promised. Jesus has a promised gift for your life. Have you received the fullness of it? I've, I've showed you what the fullness looks like in Acts 2. Have you received the fullness of it? We've got to learn how to take it, grab it, and just say, Jesus, I'm not leaving until I get it all. Part of preparing means waiting. If we want the, 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 the power of Pentecost, we've got to learn the art of preparing it for Pentecost. Amen? And they also, Jesus told them this, the, the, the full picture in this preparation moment. He, he told them that, that, that this gift was about something so much more than, than what we often talk about in church. You know, I think we, so many times, and, and believe me, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the evidence of that is speaking in tongues. But so many times we can get so wrapped up on speaking in tongues, we think that's the end goal of it. It's not. The end goal of, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit for your life is not speaking in tongues. Let me tell you what it is. Jesus says in Acts 1.8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's the fruit of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I think so many times we, we have such a high view of these disciples. Yeah, these people, like I just said, they, they, they gathered together and, and they were willing to contend with God until they got which, that which God had, had promised for them. But sometimes I wonder if some of them were just kind of waiting aimlessly. 
You just think about it here for a second. Like I said, Jesus Christ, he came and he lived among us. And he began to call his disciples one by one. And they came from very lowly, uneducated backgrounds. And, 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 and his ministry changed their life over the course of three years. And then a shocking thing happened. Jesus died. He died. None of them were expecting that. And then they were all afraid and they all hid. And then after that, Jesus raises from the dead. It blew their minds. They, they, they didn't know Jesus was going to do that, even though he told them he was going to do that. He rose from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and they were just sitting with him. And, they, and then they asked Jesus at one point, they say, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? That's what they think Jesus is going to do now. And then Jesus just whoosh, goes up into heaven. Right before that, he tells them, he says, no, I'm not going to restore the kingdom of heaven. He says, you are. You're going to be my witnesses. And you're going to go to not only Jerusalem, not only to Judea, but you're going to go to Samaria and you're going to go to all of the ends of the earth. And I just wonder if when they heard that and then they saw Jesus go up, they just thought, hey, how am I going to do this? They were waiting aimlessly, I can imagine. Some of them, they had no clue what they were doing. All they knew how to do was wait. Sometimes you don't know what the next step is, but all you need to know to do is just to wait on him. They waited. Jesus gave them an impossible task. They couldn't go to Jerusalem. They couldn't go to Samaria. They couldn't go to the ends of the earth. He gave them an impossible task, and then he left them. Let me tell you something here tonight, church. God's calling every single one of you to do something impossible. When God gets involved in your life, God begins to call you to do impossible things. That's why we need the Holy Spirit in our life. And I'll just tell you, God calls you to do impossible things because if you could do things on your own strength, you would get the glory. God calls you to do things that you can't do on your own strength. Why? So that when you do it, He gets the glory. Now, I can remember when I was in Nepal, and I've told some of you this story. Maybe you remember it, but... Uh, I had these four young Nepali children in my, or youth in my, uh, in my room one night, and I was just asking them all of these questions. I just said, do you guys ever have any questions about Jesus? Now, these kids had never heard the gospel. I'd never explained anything about Jesus to them. And one of them said, yeah, I've been feeling this. What is this? Is this Jesus? I feel this whenever I'm with you I feel this right now. What is this? Now, I couldn't provoke that in them, but they began to feel this. And I began to explain Jesus Christ to them. And, and as I began to do that, in very simple ways, they just began to weep. Three out of the four of them received Jesus Christ as their Savior that night. Now, that's not something I could have ever done. That's not something I could have ever prepared for. That's something only God can do. And, and I'll tell you, that night when I, I laid down in my bed, I stood up almost the whole night, I was just absolutely shocked because for me, God did something impossible. And again, that's what God does. God does the impossible. But I was shocked for a moment about how God could operate in someone's life like this. But what kept me up all night was not the fact that God operated like this. It's that God used me. And I lived my entire life up until that point, and I never believed I was someone capable of being used by God. And that kept me up all night. Church, tonight I want to tell you you're capable of being used by God. I don't know what you've been through in your past. I don't know what you're going through right now. But God wants you to be his witnesses to Buford and to Atlanta and to Georgia and to the ends of the earth. This is not just a pastor's thing. This is an every believer thing. Receive the promised gift. And I tell you right now, just over the last year, I've, I've been rethinking a lot about my own walk with faith. And, and I know in the Pentecostal church, we talk a lot about anointing and we talk a lot about calling. And we'll look at someone's huge ministry and we'll say, man, that person just has such a great calling. Or that person has such a great anointing. And, and, and I'm just getting a little tired of that. Your capacity for ministry is not determined by your capacity of calling or your capacity of, of anointing. Your capacity for ministry is based solely on your capacity to surrender. 
if you can just learn to surrender, God will use you. And if you can just learn to just surrender those impossible things to God, God will begin to use you in your life. What's the impossible thing in your life? Is it the prodigal that's in your family? Is it like me to where you don't believe that God could use you? What's the impossible thing in your life? For these men and women, it was, it was that they would go to the four corners of the earth and establish the kingdom of God. I don't know what it is for you, but I, I want you to, to think about that. God is calling you to the impossible so that he might be glorified. You know, in uh, Luke's account of the gospel, Luke wrote the gospel of Luke and he wrote Acts. And, and Luke mentions three different times where Jesus appeared to his disciples uh, in between the resurrection and, and going, uh, finally ascending into heaven. Well, we just read one of them, but at the end of uh, the Gospel of Luke, he mentions about how uh, the disciples were all in a room and they were afraid. And, and again, in just preparing, every, from, from the time Jesus raised from the dead, he's just preparing his disciples. Luke chapter 24, he says, When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? Jesus, he, the, the disciples, they're all in a room, they're afraid, they're hiding, and Jesus just appears to them. And there's so many different amazing things uh, about what happens in this passage. I encourage you to go back and read it. But one thing that I just want you to see is that Jesus showed them the, the holes in his hands and, and the holes in his feet. You know, I've often asked myself, why did Jesus raise from the dead and he still had those holes? You know, I can imagine when he raised, he didn't have all the bruises, he didn't have all the scratches, but he kept the holes in his hands. He kept the holes in his feet. Why did he do that? And there's a number of re different reasons why Jesus did that. He did that to show them that, that he truly was victorious over that cross. He did it to show them that he did truly love them. But he made a point to show it to his disciples. Tonight I want you to know that in preparing for Pentecost we've got to look at Jesus. We've got to look at what he's showing us. We can't see Pentecost unless we look at what Jesus is showing us. Jesus made it a point to just say look at me. Right now in the church we're doing this terrible thing where we're comparing ourselves. This has been a problem for the church ever since it began. We compare ourselves to each other. We compare ourselves to the world. Jesus, in that moment, he says, look, I know you're afraid right now. I know the circumstances doesn't seem in your favor, but I need you to look at me. Church, I don't know what you're going through tonight, but we need to look at Jesus. And we need to begin to begin to, to, to compare our lives to Jesus. You know, uh, we, we will never get the fullness of Pentecost if we're constantly comparing ourselves to each other. So many times in so many churches, and, and it doesn't happen here at Buford like it does at other churches, but we have this terrible habit of waiting on someone else to start. We wait on someone else to lift their hands before we lift our hands. We wait on someone else to share the gospel before we share the gospel. We want someone else to pioneer something. But we've got to learn to stop comparing ourselves to other people and comparing ourselves solely to Christ. You think about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, like I said, he came to this earth. He suffered and he died for us. And, and, and he has the holes in his hands to prove it. And then he sent those same disciples out. I, one of my favorite passages of scripture is Hebrews 11. In Hebrews 11, we just see what all of these great men and, and women have done throughout the years uh, just because of faith. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Moses did that. And you just see what all of these amazing men did by faith. I was reading it about two months ago, and it just hit me. I've always wanted to be like those men. I want my faith to be like those men, but at he, at Hebrews chapter 12, it opens up after telling about all of those great men, and it just says this. It says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't even look at those men. Don't even look at those women. Fix your eyes on Jesus. 
who for the joy set before him endured the cross for the sake of sinners. Fix your eyes on that, church. So many of you, you might be questioning what God is calling you to do in your life. You might look at what happens in Acts and you might see what these 120 men did. And you might say, hey, I don't know if, if I could ever do that. And, 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 and that sounds very challenging. You know, Jesus tells them to, to be his witnesses. And in the Greek, it's, the term is martus, which is the word we get martyr from. And, and, and so many of you, you know what happened to the disciples. They went and they shared the gospel around the world and, and they were killed because of their faith should be no secret that the world is growing more hostile to Christians every single day. So many of you, you might say, okay, this seems like a challenge. Surrender seems like a challenge. I have to surrender my finances. I have to surrender my time. I have to surrender my pride. It seems like a challenge. Church, I want to tell you tonight, don't compare yourself to other people. Fix your eyes on Jesus. In preparation for Pentecost, he showed them the holes in his hands. He said, look at this. If we wanted the fullness of Pentecost, we've got to see Jesus rightly. Tonight we're going to do communion here in just a minute. I'm so excited for that. Because this is the closest thing we'll see Jesus. You know, you want to see Jesus on the cross, truly. You want to experience his, his death and resurrection. You want to experience his, his blood and his body being broken. This is, what the disciple, this is what the Bible tells us to do. It's my prayer that tonight you would see Jesus. That's my only hope for tonight. That as we're preparing for Pentecost, we would have a greater vision of Jesus Christ. You know, there's one final encounter that Jesus has according to Luke's account. And like I said, Jesus experienced a lot of people, but there was a couple of people he sought out. He sought out the 120. He sought out the disciples in that room. And then Luke mentions this very obscure a passage about two men in Luke chapter 24. He mentions this passage about two men who were just walking on a road to Emmaus. These men are just walking. It says that Jesus appeared before them and Jesus walked with them. And they began to ask him questions and, and Jesus began to reveal to him, uh, to them about how he was revealed in the prophets and, and the law. And, and then he invited them into his house and, and then he broke bread with them. And uh, verse, chapter, or verse 30 of chapter 24 says this, When he had, was at the table with them, he took bread gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Their eyes were open and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were our hearts not burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? That's one of the most powerful passages I think I've ever seen. Were our hearts not burning within us? You know, that's the most appropriate feeling for experiencing a resurrected Savior. And tonight, and from the time worship just began, I, I've been feeling the burning presence of Jesus Christ. And maybe you've been feeling that too. And maybe even as we've been talking about the calling of God and, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, maybe you've just been feeling this burning sensation within you that maybe God's calling me to something more. That's exactly what they felt. But when they broke bread, it was confirmed. They saw Jesus. In every single one of these passages that we've read here tonight, uh, in, in the road to Emmaus, in, in, the, in the room where the disciples were afraid, and at the very last passage in Acts where Jesus is about to ascend to heaven, every single one of them involved a, a meal. Jesus was eating with his disciples. I don't know why Jesus chose this. But I know that Jesus has the opportunity to be, to be revealed in a special way tonight. You know, I told you at the beginning of the service that, that, that I'm Pentecostal, so I'm a little weird. And I hope that you're a little weird too. But I think the church so often gets so many things wrong about communion. 
We get so focused on this is not that and this is, this is only this. But if you want to see a passage in Scripture that just speaks to the power of communion, it's this passage here on the road to Emmaus. They broke bread and they saw Jesus. When I eat communion, when I partake of communion, I'm not just partaking in something that the, the church has been doing for 2,000 years. I'm not just remembering that Jesus Christ, He died for me even though that's huge right there, I have the opportunity to see Jesus in a new way. Tonight, we're going to take communion, and we're going to do it in a little bit different way. Um, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That's what we read so oftentimes when we do communion. And I'm going to pray for this. And in the same way we prayed over that building, that the Holy Spirit would dwell in that place, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit inhabits the elements that we are going to partake. And I'm going to pray that tonight, that your heart is prepared for the power of Pentecost. I'm going to pray that this place is prepared for the power of Pentecost. So much so that that someone who might just be coming because it's Memorial Day will encounter the power of the Holy Spirit this Sunday. But I want to tell you tonight, That if you're feeling the burning sensation of God amongst you, you don't have to wait till Sunday. You can experience God right now. And so after I read this passage and pray over this, here's we're not all going to take this at the same time. I want you to just pray. And some of you, you need to learn how to wait. Some of you, you need to learn how to tarry for just a moment. And if you want to come down to this altar and receive communion here, I would love it if some of you did that. Some of you, you might be feeling like God is calling you to something more. I want to anoint you uh, that the Holy Spirit might fall down on you, that you might be filled with power to do more, that you might be called to walk in the impossible by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so if you'll stand with me, again, I'm going to read this, I'll pray. You can take the elements in your seat and be dismissed. Or you can pray for a little bit before you take it. Or you can come up here and receive it up here and receive prayer. If you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit tonight, you can get the baptism of the Holy Spirit tonight. Even right now, you can receive the power of the Holy Spirit. God is not too far off. And so Paul says this, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you do this, whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, right now, Jesus, we surrender our lives to you. God, we look at you. We look at you, a a, a Christ who, a Messiah who who not only lived for us, but died for us, God. And as we're about to take these elements, we just recognize your death and your resurrection, Father. Jesus, I ask that your Holy Spirit would fall down on us right now, God. That in the same way you inhabited the, the, the temple, you would inhabit these elements. And that you would inhabit the new temple, which is your sons and your daughters. Spirit of God, would you fall down on your sons and your daughters right now, Jesus? We proclaim your death until...